Willow for the NES by Capcom, based on the Ron Howard flick of the same name with Warwick Davis portraying the titular protagonist, circa 1989. And yes, I even have the 2001 remastered copy by 20th Century Fox. Kind of makes me wish I had the original RCA Columbia version. But, all historical banter aside, why waste another precious fucking minute, right? Before this latest review commences, I'd like to take this most precious opportunity and acknowledge the following groups, individuals, companies, you name it, be they local or abroad. First off, Brookline Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, as well as their new Vox Pop Studio in Assembly Row, Boston Open Screen, DIY The Show, the Weird Local Productions and Weird Local Film Festival team, Jules Carrazza from Gen Y Films and Goliath Post, Triple Yeah Productions, Bob White of the Bumbling Gentleman fame, Boston Casting, Bit Bar Salem, Matt Lister from Dover, New Hampshire, Amber Hughes, Kara Voxney from Anderson, Indiana, Matt Michael and Sarah Rose Stone from Clovis, California, Screaming Ostrich, Independent Film Festival Boston, Boston Underground Film Festival, The Deck Collective, Boston 8-Bit, Geek Beat Radio, James Rolfe and Mike Matei from Cinemassacre, Metal Jesus Rocks, Josh Riggs from Rigged Games, Kinsey Burke aka Kinzilla, Tamashi Hiroka, Riley Sky 100, Cygnus Destroyer 20XX, Not Free Cells Kevin James and Tom Chow for Dramen, Alicia Jean Orsini Labita from Good Nature Duck Productions and Women in Film and Video New England, Ian Bergeson Care of 16 Bit Heroes in the Off Season, Ellie Bridget and Lee Foster Holmes from Les Hangout, Autumn Lee Bales aka Old School Gamer Mama from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, John Fisher from John Fisher Photography in Waltham, Aaron Hickman aka Daya and 8 Bit Eric from San Antonio, Texas, Pat Country the NES Punk, Retro Gamer 3, Pam from Cannot Be Tamed, Chavez Slovakia, The Mount Vernon Kid, Girl with Yellow Spoon and Plum Drop 11, Ringo Studios, Catalyst Comedy, Starlap Studios, Cathead Pictures, High Energy Vintage, Game Underground, Sudden Impact, Replayed, Land of Electronics, Jeff Butterworth and Gina Tang, Care of RX Strength Training, and finally, the British American Business Council of New England. Anyways, with these out of our system, onto the game's main premise. If you've seen the film by now, as ever, God help me if I fucking meet someone who hasn't. It should be second nature at the very least. It revolves around the titular farmer slash family man of the Dwarven Hobbit like Nelwyn race, reluctant Willow Ufgood, portrayed by the aforementioned pre leprechaun Warwick Davis, of course, who comes across a baby of an unprecedented prophecy near the river, hence her Daikini birthmark, and is enlisted by his village sorcerer slash ruler, the High Alduin, portrayed by the late Billy Barty, to go on a quest with a pack of other Nelwins, including his douchebag boss Burgle Cut, portrayed by the also late Mark Northover, his companion Migosh, portrayed by the also late David J. Steinberg. The village's best warrior, Vonkar, portrayed by Phil Fondacaro of Troll, The Black Cauldron, and Killer Clowns from Outer Space fame, and even a few others, including Tony Cox. During their wary quest to deliver the infant to Laura Dannon, portrayed by not only the Greenfield twins, Ruth and Kate, but also Rebecca Behrman, Laura Hopkirk, Isla Brentwood, and Gina Nelson, with the latter four replacing the already credited former two due to their unbearably large size for Willow's backpack. The Nelwins come across an already caged Daikini warrior by the name of Mad Mardigan, portrayed by Val Kilmer, long before even the infamous Batman Forever, no less. And don't think I'm not aware of his other appearances either. Top Secret, Real Genius, Top Gun, Kill Me Again, The Doors, Thunderheart, Tombstone, The Real McCoy, Heat, The Saint, Prince of Egypt, you name it, who later gets freed with a promise to look after Alora. However, after inadvertently leaving her behind, a race of miniature tribal beings referred to as the Brownies not only Shanghai the Infant, but also detain and later free the Nelwins by order of the Fairy Queen Sherlandria, portrayed by Maria Halvo. Upon being convinced of his ultimate destiny by Sherlandria and sending Migosh on his way, the much encouraged Willow, with the help of only two of the Brownies, Frangian and Rule, portrayed by Rick Overton and Kevin Polak respectively, as well as the misguided Mad Mardigan, the aging sorceress turned opossum Finn Rizel, portrayed by the late Patricia Hayes, who was not only in Never Ending Story years prior to Willow, but also in A Fish Called Wanda later that same year. But I digress who's also seen being changed into various other animals, hence Industrial Light and Magic's groundbreaking metamorphosis effects at the time. And even an old comrade of Mad Mardigan's, Eric Thawbearer, portrayed by Gavin O'Hurley, son of the late Dan O'Hurley from Robocop 1 and 2 and Halloween 3, fully intends to rise up against the dark forces of the tyrannical Queen Bath Morta, portrayed menacingly by Jean Marsh, her rebellious daughter Sorcia, and her bloodthirsty, not-to-be-fucked-with Army Commander General Kale, portrayed by Kilmer's later, now ex-wife, Joanne Wally, and the late Patrick Roach, respectively. This particular NES RPG adaptation, however, incorporates an all-new premise rife with mythological elements absent from the film. Case in point, there are these two spirits watching over the fictional world in which it's set, namely that of the skies, providing all human beings with light and power, and the other of the Earth, providing the inhabitants with courage and hope. 
both of whom have sent messengers to further their intended aim of maintaining everlasting peace and granting the magical powers. These messengers, however, turned against each other, hence the aforementioned Baph Marta and Finn Rizal individually, the former of whose power-greedy ass wants nothing more than to conquer all civilization, while the latter gets transformed into a possum after convincing the corrupt hag of a queen to return with her back to the skies, thereby sealing the sorceress's magic for all time. Now it's up to the very same reluctant farmer-turned-prophesied hero to restore the balance of peace by once and for all toppling Baph Marta, her dark magic, and warmongering forces. Regarding the gameplay, being much more than a top-view action-adventure RPG, akin to not only the Zelda franchise, but also Falcom's Yeats franchise and SNK Blame Wars Crystallis aka Godslayer, with the latter being released not long after, one might add. You start off in the Nelwyn Village, familiarizing yourself with not just the terrain, but all the important huts that you visit. Case in point, whenever you're wary from your travels, you can visit Willow's family, specifically his wife Kaya, and their two kids Rannon and Mims, portrayed by Julie Peters, Mark Vanderbreck, and Don Fanning respectively, to get yourself healed. The High Alduin, to not only obtain your magic acorns, you know, the ones that Willow uses to turn his opponents into stone, like in the goddamn film, but also recharge your magic meter. And even the aforementioned Vonkar, to obtain your first ever longsword to attack with, which of course has to be equipped in the menu before fighting with it. Speaking of which, in terms of control setup, just like all top few action RPGs, your D-pad controls the determined Nelwyn adventure in any possible direction, not just straight in both horizontal and vertical directions, but also diagonally. Start brings up your menu within which you can access the swords, shields, and magic to equip or disarm, and even the key items that you've discovered. B and A lets Willow attack using the sword and magic on the field, respectively, and equip or disable said sword, shield, and or magic tool in the menu individually. Upon hauling ass through the North Path, not only does a random Nelwyn last tell you about the next village, do, you'll end up encountering random foes along the way, whether from the film or created especially for this adaptation alone, the former including the Death Dogs, the very same ones that brutally assaulted the midwife at the beginning before she sent Alora adrift, and during the Nelwyn Festival after Willow fucked up his iconic disappearing pig trick, and the Alduin so-called unsuccessful recruiting of the Hopefuls, not to mention those infamous Terra's Lean Trolls, and even the Ebersisk Beast. While the latter includes batches of slime, some of which even split into four segments, floating skulls, giant flies, some of which come in other colored variations, likewise for various opposing otherworldly and medieval beings, including snake men, living trees spewing out fire, bats, half-nude zombies that'll transform you into a pig, two-headed and six-armed ogres, skeletons with shields, wizards, armored human soldiers, and the like. Regarding the combat system, not only are you allowed to swing your sword in one of two possible ways, straight on via B in your desired direction simultaneously, or if you include the two directions specific angled patterns, in this case three in total, 135 degrees horizontally west or east, or 175 degrees vertically north or south, via just B alone, predating a link to the past by even two years. Your swordplay capabilities are precisely dick all, thanks to Willow's slow as molasses speed. But as you level them up depending on how much experience points you accumulate by slaying every adversary in his vicinity, they become even more advanced and augmented, notwithstanding how timely and head-on your offenses have to be. Ditto for when you equip and use your magical technique and or item, which, obviously, depletes a very portion of your MP. Should you happen to endure way too much fucking damage, your nail and ass is grass and this game's the goddamn lawnmower! Okay, we're not going there. Thank god you're able to continue without any end whatsoever, but only at the previous point you leveled up and or the previous village or milestone you visited, prior to your recent Mortal Coil shuffling, with the alternate choice of absorbing a password, about which will be further discussed. Shifting back into the overall quest itinerary, not only does Willow visit Dew to find out about the village chief's accursed son, Bogarda, and the cruel acts that he's committed from his inhabitants, including the old blacksmith, I might add, who provides you with a heal mace for instantaneous life recovery and instant recovery of both life and magic upon each visit, individually. He's also charged with discovering the gold statue in order to go into Bogarda's cave, acquiring both the ring and battle sword, the former of which adds 10 extra points to Willow's overall strength, with the latter shitting excessively on the longsword, ditto for every other sword you find and equip throughout, facing and toppling Bogarda himself, thereby earning a new magic incantation upon changing him back to normal human form, flowing fire, aka fire floor, which upon summoning, creates a ring of flames around Willow that are deadly to every foe he confronts, and is especially effective against the trolls, encounter a rabbit like being hailing from the Nail Clan by the name of Chill, who's been ruined on the east side of the bridge, until the moment you've made the aforementioned Bogarda your forever bitch, whom you'll run into again for a special item, 
running into the diminutive, mischievous brownie duo, obviously Rule and Frangine, to find out about where to visit Trilindra and get her iconic wand, specifically Lake Chief, after going through the Death Forest Cave and running into an unwilling dragon by the name of Mitanda, who, instead of just handing over the Crystal Ball of Life as the brownies ordered, lends you the Left Behind Thieves bracelet, prior to which you end up finding yet another much augmented sword and shield, as well as the Dragon Scale. <laughs> Freeing Mad Mardigan from his cage with a key near the very same Lake Chief, meeting up with his new pterodactyl-like creature by the name of Poe, who hands you an ocarina to call him whenever you feel like visiting earlier discovered realms, again, predating Link to the Past. Acquiring the Seat of Waka, which of course has jack shit to do with Final Fantasy X, period, from the very same Kachil, with which to breathe underwater as you approach the Northern Islands, on which the earlier recounted Finn Rizel is also marooned, amongst various other side quests leading up to when you approach both Tira's Lean and Nakmar, again, just like its source material. Other boss characters include the cursed Mooj, who before facing him, Willow has to first come in contact with Gina, aka the spirit of his long-since-deceased better half, and acquire her cross flute, the aforementioned Eversisk Beast, and finally the dreaded, heartless son-of-a-bitch bastard General Kale and that fucking repressive-ass, spiteful-ass hag Baph Morda, all of whom, with possibly the exception of the also-earlier recounted Bogarda and Mooj, who are absolute invertebrates as long as you're skilled enough before reaching the two, by the way, will ensure that your quest will be in the most unimaginable deal of vain. No, scratch that! They'll flat-out leave your ass in an inescapable, hot-water-filled tub of eternal melancholy and confinement, in a way one's never imagined or fathomed. Suspenseful, over-the-top pros aside, not only do you really have to watch your ass against those menacing pissant douches, as well as during every common skirmish with a mishmash variety of foes, but also the junctures at which to use certain key items in our magic tools, incantations, etc. And while we're at it, be prepared to grind your ass off a lot if you're willing to stand any chance during the area-specific boss altercations. Control-wise, as jerky and half-unwieldy as they tend to be at first, mostly in terms of the swordplay system and the demanding as hell timing, they're actually very responsive and spot-on, ditto for every basic command no less, and the overall far-reaching gameplay framework is nothing short of unequivocal, albeit rarely paradoxical, mostly in terms of the exploration factor, in which case you're better off consulting the required online maps. And let me tell you, I'm definitely not bullshitting here! Taking Willow's challenge into account, as is the case with the earlier referenced Zelda franchise, due for the also previously referenced Crystalis and the Eve series, expect an unprecedented shitload of them, regardless of which tribulation you take upon yourself. Not only do you have to get the ultimate, straightforward gist of Willow's overall abilities, which of course, for the sake of time, I'm at no liberty to echo here, total, unwavering awareness of his surroundings, purposes, strategic plans and stats is of the utmost essence. Cases in point, with the exception of the first three swords, five if you include the Devil Eye and Wonder Sword, all found in chests, the Dragon Sword is bequeathed to you by the former Duke Blacksmith, upon returning to him yet again with the Dragon Scales from the Death Forest Caves. <laughs> Sword and its added strength are bestowed to you by the Eagle Clan siblings, a Deek, seen in the caves located between the accursed bridge east of Tira's Lean, and a Bong, seen within Nakmar Castle, respectively. And the Kaiser Sword is bestowed to you by Eric, discovered within Tira's Lean before facing the Ebersisk. Upon first meeting Finrazel in a possum form, you're informed that you'll have to reach the 13th level in order to completely transform her back as a normal human, at which juncture she'll apply more power to Shalindra's wand, aka the cane, as a means to Bathmorda's eventual motherfucking demise. Then in order to acquire the Crest of the Spirits, you have to visit both the West and East Towers, within which the spirits of both the Earth and Skies, mentors of both Finrazel and Bathmorda individually, reside, and thus provide the Red and Blue Crystals so they can be joined with said Crest upon being provided by Alora's Caretaker, residing in the soul structure located between said Towers. And most importantly, before reaching the castles of Sirius Lean and Nakmar individually, to ensure the absolute fulfillment of your quest, first and foremost, converse with two nameless old souls in the cave near the cursed bridge before Sirius Lean, one old lady who yammers on about how impossible it is to get there, on which I'm officially calling 100% certified horseshit, and an old man who provides you with the witch's shoes to cross that bridge, thereby further disproving her deceptive theory. And secondly, visit yet another old lady, except she's located in a boarded-up home near the southwest edge of the Tirasling Castle Gates, in order to nab the key to Nakmar, with which to access the castle, despite being initially intended for Eric. 
and be sure to reunite with the brownies to not only snatch the power of unrequited love before confronting Sorsha, but to also gather hints on how to reach Nakamar via hidden tunnels. And before I forget, should you reach the castle, be sure to use the Spectre incantation and transform into a slime to scare off that one random pussy-ass castle guard. Jeez, talk about a fucking wimp. Anyways, all these hints and more should sink in as deep as an anchor hit in any floor of an ocean or a river, as they are mandatory as fuck if you contemplate on successfully accomplishing your end-all be-all goal. And as I established not too long ago, not only are you given the choice to continue from the previous village and recently achieved level upon death, you're also given a randomly generated 18-digit password for future reference, as it and or they can be jotted down from observation or looked up online whenever possible. Graphically, for an underrated film tie-in hailing from the same year as Batman and the infamous Back to the Future by Sunsoft and the tragically combined efforts of LJN and Beam Software individually, Willow's overall look and design is far from an utter, nauseating eyesore, but even kicking off with such a description would be considered the ultimate end-all be-all understatement of the millennium. As outdated and condensed as the presentation might be, the overall background and foreground layouts are magnificently vivid, impeccably resembling those of the game's source material. From the correlating villages, castles, and dungeons, some from the film, or exclusively introduced in this particular adaptation, and in-game exclusive caves, cause what the hell, it's a fantasy-themed RPG, to the multitude of main supporting and opposing characters. On the latter, once more, it's the same bifaceted set of guidelines and that Willow's depicted as he's intended to, minus his cape, of course, but can be rather off-putting at times due to being shown the same sword and shield animations and designs, regardless of which types he's equipped with. And despite that, makes even Tyrion Lannister and Gilius Thunderhead look like fucking Emperor Pilaf and Eric Cartman individually. Ditto for everyone else, including the aforementioned Mad Mardigan, Willow's family, namely Kaya, Mims, and Rannon, the High Alduin, Vonkar, Eric Thogbear, Roland Frangine, Sherlindria, Finn Rizel, Sorcerer, General Kale, Bathmorda, and especially the vast assortment of foes about which won't be reiterated, but have more than underwent a slightly differentiating palette swap in tandem with higher strength and HP. And don't even get me started, goddammit, with the exterior enemy skirmishes, during which the earlier stated foreground and background elements, you know, the trees, bushes, the desert bridges, water waves, etc., are animated to a T, as if there's a storm brewing all around our main hero. Amongst every other graphical aspect I've taken up, Capcom definitely wasn't fucking around when it came to this key department here, and ditto for, yep, you guessed it, the music and sounds, composed immaculately by the incomparable Harumi Fujita of Ghosts and Goblins and Gargoyles Quest fame alongside Ayako Mori and Yoko Shimomura, now part of Square Enix, respectively, Mega Man 3, in said case, the Needle Man and Gemini Man themes, and a portion of the ending staff roll, except everything else was handled by Yasuaki, again, no relation. Not to mention Skyblazer and Spawn for Ukiyote and Sony and Whoopi Camp's Tomba fame. While the majority of every original accompanying track doesn't sound anything like the late James Horner's original film soundtrack, because copyright, I suppose, they're all very unique and memorable, laden with mixed themes of serenity and peril, notwithstanding how redundant they turn out to be and their obvious lack of variety between each correlating scene. The sound effects are on the same goddamn boat, turning out to be nothing more or less than typical action RPG fare, but are far from grating or inessential. And before I wrap this all up, take note of my top 10 songs displayed here, with 5 honorable mentions at the bottom, or in this case, 5. Replay value-wise, taking it into consideration not only the fact that Capcom decided to incorporate an all-new, outlandish premise within this game serving as a far cry from its source material, while in turn sticking to the extreme ladder, but also how massive in scope it is compared to the others. In which case, yet again, be prepared to waste a generous portion of your life, tediously yet strenuously grinding your ass off, healing yourself often to avoid sudden demises, figuring out your way around every perplexing structure, be it a cave, dungeon, or lack fucking thereof, and most importantly, standing your ground against the most resilient-ass rivals who make even Death Adder and Ganon look like Frank and Joe Hardy from the original Hardy Boys novels. Not to be confused with the wrestlers, mind you all, Willow for the NES, as underrated as many claim it to be, is beyond the goddamn midnight shadow of a doubt, worth diving into and embracing every now and again for generations yet to come, just like the timeless fantasy romp it's based on. Therefore, consider yourself insane as shit to leave this action RPG out in the cold. Willow. 
Before I forget, there's even an arcade adaptation also released by Capcom that very same year, except the gameplay procedure is completely different, akin to Ghouls and Ghosts and Strider, with the latter being out that very same year, complete with a shopping system akin to Forgotten Worlds, I might add. And considering the fact that this wasn't ported to home consoles like the others, should you happen to come across any still-working machine of this, or have a burning opportunity to emulate this, like I did, HEY, GO NUTS! <laughs> Henceforth, what's my final verdict on this obscure but worthwhile film-to-game adaptation? It's easy to see why many prefer the Zelda franchise and the other RPGs I've referenced thus far, to which I say, more power to them, but after listening to what I've expressed about this solid, above-average, 30-year-old movie-to-RPG adaptation, consider these and other points a fair aggregation of incentives to seek it out by any means necessary, as it'll run you 12 bucks loose, if slightly less, or a range between 37 to 105 bucks complete in box. Bottom line, and forgive any hints of slander in advance, the last thing you're gonna want is a hairy chest if this memorable game's not in your library by now, so I'd get my ass out there and revel in an overabundance of whirlwind adventures after another with Willow if I were you. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off. And remember, forget all you know, or think you know.